Who was Sacagawea? Chapter 3 <clears throat> Bird Woman's River The winter of 1804-05 was very cold. At sunrise on January 9th, it was 21 degrees below zero. The next morning, it was 40 below. No wonder the Indians called this time of year frost in the teepee. The people at Fort Mondon tried to stay warm and find food, but the hunters had little luck. Fortunately, Mondon Indians from nearby villages traded corn to the explorers. The Mondon also showed the voyagers how they made blue glass beads. Indians called these chief beads. Tribes in the Northwest used them as money. The beads were also worn as hair decorations, earrings, and necklaces. Sacagawea had a belt of blue beads. It was her prized possession. Early in April, Lewis and Clark sent some men and a barge back to President Jefferson. The boat carried souvenirs for the president. These included a prairie dog, four magpies, many newly discovered plants, and an Indian robe. In the meantime, the men at Fort Mondon were busy. They built new boats so they could continue their long journey to the ocean. These boats were loaded with food and other supplies. On April 9th, the voyagers, including Sacagawea, Charbonneau, and Pomp, left Fort Mondon. They rowed up the Missouri River in six small canoes and two pirogues. The pirogues were long, narrow rowboats with sails. As they paddled west, every traveler but one was leaving home farther behind. Only Bird Woman was heading toward home. For five years, she had not seen her family or friends. She had been enslaved, first by the Minotauri, then by Charbonneau. Now, thanks to Lewis and Clark, she was heading back to the land of her birth. Would she meet her people there? Were her family and friends still alive? What would they think of her baby? Sometimes Sacagawea rode in one of the boats. Often she walked along the shore with Clark. Pomp traveled in a cradleboard on his mother's back. At night, Bird Woman and her family shared a tent with the two captains and York. Clark came from a large, loving family. He quickly grew fond of Sacagawea and Pomp, and he soon saw that letting Sacagawea come along had been a very wise decision. On their third day out of Fort Mondon, Sacagawea found some tasty wild artichokes while on shore. She cooked these roots for dinner. Bird Woman found many kinds of plant foods during the expedition. Among them were currants and gooseberries. Five weeks later, Sacagawea prevented a disaster. May 14, 1805 was very foggy. Lewis and Clark were walking along the Missouri River. Bird Woman, with pomp on her back, was in one of the pirogues. Her husband was steering. Several other men were also in the boat. They were 300 feet from shore. Suddenly, a gust of wind upset the boat. It quickly filled with water. Charbonneau cried out that he couldn't swim. As the other men desperately bailed out the boat, Sacagawea saw their supplies floating away. Later, Clark wrote in his journal, A squall of wind struck our sail broadside and turned the pirogue nearly over. The articles which floated out were nearly all caught by Sacagawea. In this pirogue were our papers, instruments, books, medicine, and in short, almost every article necessary to ensure the success of the enterprise. Had she not saved the supplies, the expedition might have had to turn back. The captains wanted to honor Sacagawea, so they named a creek in central Montana for her. This stream we called Bird Woman's River, after our interpreter, the Snake Woman, wrote Lewis. On maps, it is called the Sacagawea River. The Missouri River became swifter and clearer as they approached the mountains. Cottonwood and willow trees lined the riverbanks. In the distance, pines and junipers topped the high land, the higher land. But higher land also meant colder temperatures. At night, water in the kettles crusted with ice, even though it was late May. Rain and snow made traveling difficult, but there were plenty of deer and buffalo to hunt. The explorers stored the meat in their canoes.
The men pulling the loaded canoes had to wade in icy water up to their armpits. The ground was also very mucky. Those on the shore had to take off their moccasins and walk barefoot. Hardly a day passed without problems. Captain Clark and Bird Woman were almost bitten by rattlesnakes. Mosquitoes stung the men and turned Pomp's little body into a mass of red sores. One man after another came down with flu, fevers, and diarrhea. Sakagawea began running a fever around June 1st. As she grew worse, the captains feared that she would die. They were also afraid that the expedition would fail without her. How would they trade for horses without their Shoshone translator? Without horses, how would they get across the Bitterroot Mountains? And who would take care of Pomp if his mother died? Clark wrote in his journal on June 16, 1805, The Indian woman very bad and out of her senses. The captains took turns caring for Sakagawea. They gave her tea made of tree bark. They brought her iron-rich water from springs. Not until June 24th did she feel better. By then, the expedition had reached the Great Falls of the Missouri River. These waterfalls dropped 400 feet. The voyagers could not go up the falls in their boats. They had to drag their boats around them. This is called portaging. They placed the boats on wheels made from slices of tree trunk. The men then pushed and pulled the boats across the hard ground. Cactus thorns sliced the bottoms of their feet right through their moccasins. Grizzly bears sniffed around their camp at night. Lewis's dog, Seaman, barked all night to scare the bears away. Then storms hit. The worst storms struck on June 29th. Bird Woman, carrying Pomp, was walking along a dry creek bed. Charbonneau and Clark were with her. As rain began to fall, the group hid under a rock shelf. The shower turned into a downpour. Suddenly, a flash flood roared down the ravine. In seconds, the rushing water was waist high. Pushing Sakagawea and Pomp ahead of him, Clark scrambled up the steep bluff. Charbonneau pulled Sakagawea up by her hand. They escaped just before the ravine filled with 15 feet of water. Pomp's cradleboard was swept away, but Sakagawea hung onto her baby. Meanwhile, giant hailstorms pounded the main camp. Several men were hurt. One man was knocked to the ground three times. Captain Lewis reported that the hailstones were as wide as seven inches. They bounced ten feet high after striking the ground. On July 4th, the portage was complete. The falls were now behind them. The men made two new canoes, Indian style, burning and scraping out the insides of cottonwood trees. The voyagers continued up the Missouri River in their eight canoes. By late July, the land began to look familiar to Sacagawea. Her excitement grew. After five years, she was coming back to her homeland. On July 22nd, they reached a creek. Sakagawea remembered that her people had camped in this very place. Soon after, she showed the men the exact spot where she had been kidnapped. Days passed. There was still no sign of her people. The two captains grew desperate. They had counted on getting horses and guides from the Shoshone. If not, how would they cross the mountains? To make things worse, the men were exhausted. Their food was running low. Sakagawea, however, remained hopeful. When they reached a rock known as the Beaver's Head, she was sure that, a Shoshone, that the Shoshone must be nearby. On August 1st, the explorers split into two groups to look for Sakagawea's tribe. Lewis led a small group by land. Bird Woman and her family stayed with Clark and the rest of the men. They continued on by canoe.